You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, God damn it! Get the point good. And now... Fend Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. There, hi there, ho there, everybody, and happy wacka 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 doodle Wednesday. This is Grammy Mary, and I am your hostess with the most as wacka doodliness <laughs> here on this wacky Wednesday. And yeah, we are here on reallibertymedia.com channel 3, also on the rlmradio.xyz site, and uh, lots of other RLM radio places, including Spreaker and later on the YouTube channel. So hey, how y'all doing? Tell me something good. <laughs> I might actually tell you something good. You never know. But first thing I got to do, I didn't want to lose this over on Twitter, so I'm going to read this real quick to you. People do not expect to find chastity in a whorehouse. Why then do they expect to find honesty and humility or humanity in a government? A, um, let's see, a congress, I think that's probably supposed to be a congress, of institutions whose modus operandi consists of lying, cheating, stealing, and if need be, murdering those who resist. That's from H.L. Mencken, and I absolutely love that quote. Love that quote, and I'm going to go ahead and just retweet it, just because. Because that's a bam. That just said it all. Okay, and over here on Twitter, oh, and dang it, I did not get logged in over on, ooh, feel free to request. Hey, JJs, I see you over here on Twitter. How you doing, darling? Thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out over here. I truly do appreciate it. Yahoo! Mountain Dew! It is a wacky night. So, um, let me see. I may just need to go ahead and get logged in over here in the corner pocket real quick. Because I, I totally spaz that off. Go figure. Let me, let me see if I can get this done. Hmm. <laughs> uh, yay! I remembered my password. <laughs> there are times when that's rather questionable. Uh, let's see. Uh, do add quote. Oh well, hon, that I shared it. It was a Twitter thing. I shared it earlier over here in the RLMNUMNUM chat. Where is that at? Yeah, there it is. I'll just click it again. Um, and I'll copy that selected link and I'll put it down low. Down low. How low can you go? Hello, can I know, rascal, you're trying to help me. And, sweetheart, I really don't need you helping. I really don't. Okay. Um, oh, hey, this is from Sweet D Says. I like being called out if I'm incorrect. I would much rather learn than perpetuate misinformation. Willing to talk about anything? anything i'm not shy but be forewarned you may be triggered sometimes you might think we're fighting i'm usually just asking questions and laughing posts retweets are not always indicative of my personal views just like to share info if i say have a good day or night i'm likely about to mute your conversation ooh hey i'll mock things even if i agree if it's funny it's funny what can you do my profile pic is a stock photo of shh typed into google it's not me Papa is what I call my husband. Cat is what I call my daughter. Contrary to accusations, I am neither Russian spy nor a Nazi. 
I like to use words as they are literally defined, not twisted. Well, thank you, Sweet D says. I like that. And I agree with an awful lot of that, and that's kind of sort of the way I am as well. I do like that. Cool. Okay. I like her profile pic, too. Um, oh, and Sweet D's liked my tweet. Sweet. She liked it when I retweeted. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and shut that one down. Now, let's see. How many, how many Twitters do I have? <laughs> I lost a stalker. Damn it. I lost a stalker. Oh, well. Thank you, Barman, once again for tweeting me out over there. I truly do appreciate it. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to shut down Twitter now because, yeah, it's Twitter. Um, over here on the mines, I don't see anybody minding. And that's okay because if you don't mind, it don't matter. And those that mind don't matter, and those that matter don't mind. Over here in the corner pocket, I really don't see anybody playing along. Let me see if I can get a duck. Because <laughs> I have this duck thing, you know. Quack, quack, waddle, waddle. And it was already nabbed. Damn it. I'm just too slow. Over here on this FN site, thank you once again, Grimmy, for tweeting me. I also see Cantrell was over here. And Cantrell shared an awesome quote over here as well from the Israeli Prime Minister Nutty Yahoo from 1990. If we get caught, they will just replace us with persons of the same cloth. So it does not matter what you do. America is a golden calf, and we will sock it dry, chop it up, and sell it off piece by piece until there is nothing left but the world's biggest welfare state that we will create and control. Why? Because it is the will of God, and America is big enough to take the hit. So we can do it again and again and again. Sorry, Nutty Yahoo, but my name is not Ben Dover. <clears throat> this is what we do to countries that we hate. We destroy them very slowly and make them suffer for refusing to be our slaves. You said you're going to kiss on my what? No, never mind. Don't bother offering to do that because there are... I don't want your lips anywhere remotely close to any part of my anatomy, even if it's the backside. You just, no. Thank you, no. Not interested. As Julio. T.D. Sanders is also over here. Hey there, T.D. How are you doing? I noticed some of your awesome posts the other day. Really, really liking those. Thank you, dear, for doing that. I know, rascal, you love mommy. Okay, and let's see. Over here on Fakiebook, I don't think I have anybody on Fakiebook paying attention, but I did get a way cool link from over on Fakebook that I will get to here in just a little bit. Yes, baby sis, that video did make me shit my, my it made my brain shit itself. It's uh, the young man that, that does the stupid tweet things, and then he also does, it's uh, Joe San, Santag... Santa Santagato Joe. It's Joe. And it's the worst tattoos ever. And seriously, there was someone that uh had tattooed on their lower lip on the inside. It said Ass Goblin. What the hell? What is wrong with you? That there's something really, really wrong with the world when when people are starting to tattoo shit on the inside of their mouth. That's just messed in the head. Okay. Um, and finally, to the one place where you need to be if you want to give me static, over here in the RLM, I see Barman right up top. Hey there, Barman. Oh, thank you, lovely Miss Kate. That's awesome. That is an excellent quote by Mencken, by the way. Thank you, Kate. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. <coughs> Excuse me. Teamwork, teamwork, rah, rah, rah. Rah, rah, ree, kick him in the knee. Rah, rah, rass, kick him in the other knee. <laughs> ha, let's see. Let's see. 
Okay. Hi, P. Bunyan. Okay, over here on the RLM. Yeah, Barman, right up top, closely followed by Cowboy Tech, who's always hearing pleasant voices. I hope you're hearing another one tonight. I also see Grimner is here, who's also known as Odin, Is that, or is that Grimner is an alter ego of Odin? And I do believe it was Flasher that shared earlier today a meme from over on Minds about those damn ice giants went bowling. Grimmy, have you done anything about that? Bastards. I also see the lovely Moose Girl is here. Hey, Moosey, did you have a good time? It looked like you had an amazing time at the football game. I hope you did. Although, yeah, I've been to one live, like, professional football game, and it was too freaking cold for me. It's like my butt cheeks were permanently frozen. Well, not permanently, but it sure felt like it. Um, if I would have fallen too fast, I probably would have cracked them the other way. And then every time I went down a slipper side, it would go... Good thing that didn't happen, isn't it? Okay, Walker moving ahead with plan to drug test food stamp users. Ah, well, isn't that just... Why don't they just drug test everyone, starting with Congress? How's that sound? Ha! <laughs> there you go. I also see the lovely Kate is here, who was being ever so wonderful in typing out the Mencken quote. Thank you, darling. Appreciate it. And Asmodeus Asmo is here. Hey there, Asmo. Glad to see that things are working out so well on your eBay channel. That's just awesome. Yay! Yay! Mo Sorry, Moose. Beach to it. I got another friend. Oh, I only have 18 ducks under my Graham's name. Hmm. I'm working on getting me a cracked army. We have ways of taking the world over, and it's going to be with cracked ducks. Ooh, it's 50 degrees? Damn, that is way better. Because the last game I went to, it was the Chiefs and the Minnesota Vikings in Kansas City. And it was 13 degrees until you figured in the wind chill. <laughs> that was very cold. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Asmodeus Asmo. Um, Beth Z is also here. Hey there, Beth. How's things in your world? I also see Chalcedony is in the house, as well as a double dip and a Chloe. Hey, Chloe, Chloe. I see that it's just me again. I had to, I got home. I had a little bit of a fee bottle. I was somewhat concerned and confused earlier today because I saw that that another name for me got um, logged in. And it was like, whoa, wait a minute here. What the hell? I'm not home. But apparently me had dropped out and another name for me had dropped in. And so when I got home, I changed the name back and then I had to do my password all over again. And that's okay, because I'm still here. <laughs> I also see Java, 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 Java Doctor 2 is in the house. Hey, Java, how's things? How's the lovely little Lily doing? And looky there, JJ's. JJ's was playing over here on the RLM for a while. And now I believe JJ's is playing on his own channel on that webcom.co.uk. Um, I also see Juana Taco. You know what, sweetheart? That really does sound good. But I got some homemade soup that I'm going to be chowing down on later. I also see P. Bunyan is here. Hey, P. Bunyan. Timber. And the lovely rain. We have no rain, which is a good thing. Because if we have moisture falling out here, it would be snow. And I'm not ready for that yet. Because I'm kind of a wussy woo. Okay, I also see RLM Fluke is here. Yay, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. Yay. Um, how badly it failed in Florida. Mm. Oh, man, if you're trying to do art with icicles, is that what that is? I, I didn't click on the link, but, man, if you try and do that shit in Florida, I don't think that would work real good. Or are you talking about the other thing, drug testing for... Because that I could see that being a massive fail as well. Okay, let's see. Rob Works. Hey, Rob Works. Did you fire up the bubbler and I just missed it, hun? I have been somewhat distracted. People have a tendency to tell me, squirrel. Oh, you did fire up the bubbler. Thank you, dude. I see that now. And Vinny is here. 
from Vegas. You know, Vinny, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas unless Vinny's there. And then Vinny tells everybody everything because that's kind of the way Vinny rolls. I also see logged in, but not necessarily participating or playing Dakota and the lovely Dima, as well as Frumpy and I've a big one. Mm, yeah, little feller. Tell that to the next guy. Kozu is also here, as well as Moy, 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 Moy. And looky there, Nenson Dubois is also showing up in my little feed, as well as Poxified and Pompo Ponsos. And there's Slim Jim Flim, as well as the Mighty Phantom, who created my intro. Thank you, Phantom. You did a wonderful job. I really do enjoy that. Now, let's see. I got to get to this link that I got from Fakey Book. And I know there's an awful lot of people that say, Why are you still on Facebook? Why are you. You know what just uses. Okay, well, number one, I'm, I was already on Facebook when I learned of all of this shit. So it's like, ah, eh, whatever. But, um, <clears throat> la da 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 da. Um,. In any case, I'm still on Facebook because I stay in touch with my family. And I figure, you know what? The ass munchy holios already got my info. So if I try to delete it, it's kind of like anything else you put on the internet. Once it's on the internet, it's there forever. So whether you delete your profile or not, somebody's got your stats. Whether it's fakey book or FBI or CIA or NSA or some other alphabet soup brigade, they've already got your stats. They already know how to peek on you. So why in the hell run away from them? Why not just go, yeah, so, I'll make something of it, kiss my grits, all that other fun stuff, or not. I prefer you don't. I don't really want to have those kind of people with lips close to me, anywhere remotely close to me. Okay. Um, oh, and the EPA and the... <laughs> they're also full of shite. Shite, shite, shite. Has Miri B been around? I have not seen Miss Miri B. Is she very, very busy? I do remember seeing something the other day about um, an underwater cable being cut. That sucks. Damn. You know, with all of this quote unquote satellite technology that we've got, I'm on wireless internet. Why can't they? Oh, because then her internet would suck as bad as mine. Never mind. Hmm. Okay. Now, I'm going to go to this link just because I thought, Booyah! This is from globalnews.ca. Former head of the RCMP drug squad now leads national marijuana business. Hmm? In another sign, the legalization of marijuana is spurring a seismic shift in Canadian society. The former head of the RCMP drug squad now runs a pot company. A man who spent years policing the illegal drug trade is part of the new wave of entrepreneurs poised to cash in when pot becomes legal in July. Now, what's the date of this? Ah, this is dated the 4th of this year. So, Derek Ogden, president of the National Assess Access Cannabis, doesn't see his career change as a 180. His policing experience put him in an ideal position to understand the Metehuana business, he says. For the last five years of his 27-year career with the Mounties... He was in charge of drug enforcement and organized crime for the RCMP across Canada, rising to the rank of chief superintendent. Well, so, he must have gotten... Okay, we'll just leave that one alone for right now, for a little bit at least. He's seen the marketing and selling of pot up close. So... We did see a number of groups across the country that were very, very involved in the cannabis industry, and they generated a lot of revenue. And so he's wanting to get a little bit of his cut as well. 
NAC's newest clinic is on the corner of Edmonton's White Avenue and Calgary Trail, where a largely young and urban crowd comes to shop, stroll, and partay. The location is high profile, high traffic, and high visibility. Like the government's Metijuana regulations, the outlet is still under construction. In the past, the building has been an upscale grocery market, several bars, and long ago, a bank, the vaults of which are still in the basement. Ogden's company is one of hundreds of Canadian businesses working to gain a foothold in the legalized Metijuana market. I think we need to do like, um, is it Portugal? that just completely decriminalized everything across the board, decriminalized it all. And they had a dramatic decrease in drug-related crime. Ha, huh, go figure. Because if it's no longer a crime to possess or use, then naturally you're going to have a dramatic decrease in drug-related crime. Duh, just makes sense. For now, NAC helps consumers navigate the medical marijuana system with locations stretching from Victoria to PEI. The next steps are medical clinics and recreational dispensaries once all legislative hurdles have been cleared. So in other words, jump through this flaming hoop, jump through that flaming hoop, jump through this flaming hoop. By the way, by the time you're done jumping through all of those flaming hoops, you won't have to worry about getting another Brazilian wax because I think all of that's going to be singed off, but you're going to have some ugly ass blisters down there. Just saying. We think that the recreational market will probably be about 60 to 65 percent of the overall market, but medicinal is growing very quickly. The Canadian government is setting the gold standard for the cannabis market, he adds, leading to international growth potential and challenges. Ogden predicts his former RCMP colleagues will be busy on the cannabis file for a long time. It will be a real challenge to pull people from the black market to the legal regulated market. There will still be certainly organized crime involvement in the black market cannabis, but eventually, hopefully, we'll see those resources be diverted from that to other areas. The government's execution will be key, he says. Note the choice of terminology. Government's execution. I'll, yeah. If done properly, I think that the legal market has an excellent opportunity to take a really large share of black market, which yes it does, and those that are heavily invested in the black market will just become heavily invested in the quote unquote legalized market so that they can actually make a wee bit more because on the black market a lot of times you undercut prices because well you know people are a little skittish but once it becomes legal you can bump those prices up and eventually you can leave the prices the same but make the package a little bit smaller it's what everybody else does called retail and that's the way they do that shit. They retail you and retail you and retail you. I told you and I told you and I told you. Um, oh, a police chief's son accidentally shoots himself? What the heck? Oh, a three-year-old. Oh, damn. Oh, damn. Oh. Oh, thank you, Rob Works. Yeah, I'm, I'd seen the article and I didn't look at the date, but... Um, okay, Global News. Oh, okay, I shared that one. What is this, Grimmy? Uh, I'm going to copy the selected link. Oh, wait, here we go. Let's see, what is that? Why do you need an AR-15? Because 
I fucking can. There's your F-bomb for the night, the first one, because I fucking want to, because fuck you. Okay, all three of those look rather appropriate. And I have heard a few people that, you know, talked about they were pro-Second Amendment, and yet they say, you know, you didn't have AR-15s back in colonial days. Well, no, <laughs> neither did the government. The reason that the Second Amendment is so key is because whatever the government has, the populace should be able to have access to as well, just in case the government should, oh, on the off chance, let's just speak theoretical here, the government should become a tyrannical ass munch. <laughs> it's theoretical, mind you, and I'm a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, I'm speaking in theoreticals here. <laughs> yeah, right. So, in theory, if the government has it, you should be able to have it too, just to do a little tit for tat. And I know Grimmy's wanting to know who in the hell um, gets to see tits in order to put tats on them. And tats tattoo artists, Grim. You need to just hang up a shingle and say, "Hey, I can I can ink your bod, so long as you show me your tits." <laughs> you would do that, Grim. I know you would. And you would probably just put your signature there like Grimner was here or something like that I could see you doing that as well I see how you are Grimmy <laughs> okay um oh you know what I'm doing the wrong thing here oop that's the wrong one let me let me do this one yeah because I I did a copy and then I forgot it was a, it was the other one that I wanted to <laughs> I'm doing so good here don't you know huh oh and I got to tell you guys uh, we have had absolutely beautiful blue skies except for real honest to goodness clouds real clouds not that scientific mumbo jumbo bullshit you know to get you to think that those chemtrails are clouds because they're not natural clouds but yeah in any case um we have had beautiful skies out here now the wind has been a little on the obnoxious side but hey beautiful skies so i've really been enjoying the time i can be outside <sighs> except for it's a little bit chilly and so I have a little bit of a cough trying to sneak back on me but ah, I'm still doing my oil still doing my diffuser and my humidifier and all that other wire 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 thingy stuff because I don't want to get sicky sicky okay oh Jack just pinged out or just quit over here on uh, corner pocket. Now I'm going to go to my pocket. Speaking of pockets, um, and seeing as how um, we were talking about cannabis and, and y'all know that once cannabis goes off schedule one status, that will happen once uh, Big Pharma figures out a way to patent genetically modified cannabis you know that's how that shit works but while we're still talking about cannabis let's go to this one real quick I saw this one I believe it was last week when I saw it it's from from the trenches world report dot com and I I'm willing to bet you dollars to dog turds that I probably, oh no, it was posted December 5th, so it must have been yesterday. I'll bet you Rob Works shared this over in the RLM, and I just kind of sort of spazzed a little bit. Cannabis Company offers brilliant solution to opioid crisis. Trade your drugs for weed. Dude, they go. Lebanon, Oregon, as the opioid crisis continues to plague the country, one cannabis company in Oregon is proposing a new solution. Kaya Holdings, 
K-A-Y-S. Hey, that's a TV station in my hometown. The first publicly traded company to open and operate a medical cannabis dispensary is planning to set up an opioid for weed swap program where addicts can trade their pills for the plant. Um, according to the press release, their CEO, Craig Frank, said, We decided to step up and do our part after POTUS Trumpel Stilskin announced the war on opioid epidemic. You do realize that every time they declare war on, on something, it multiplies exponentially, right? You do, you do see that correlation, don't you? He went on to cite recent preliminary research suggesting that cannabis is linked to a reduction in opioid dependence and death in states where it's legal. Frank also referenced Trumpel Stilskin's recent declaration of emergency. Numerous studies, including those reported by Newsweek, NBC, U.S. News and World Report, CNN, and others at all, a.k.a. spewage, mainstream media, corporate lame-ass propaganda system, have shown that states with legal marijuana programs have declined rates or declining rates of opioid addiction, with some states reporting a decrease in deaths as high as 25%. Frank, Frank said this in the company press release. We want to help people in the communities we serve, as well as demonstrate that cannabis companies can be part of the president's solution to the crisis. Yes, it is a crisis, but I think what y'all are doing, yes, you're, you, this is commendable what you're doing, but you also need to go after those pill pushers, a.k.a. Big Pharma. And the middleman, the one between Big Pharma and the user, a.k.a. the doctors that write the prescriptions. Go after their asses, too. I bet you, you nail enough doctors, and they will stop writing that shit. Makes, see, that's the government does that all the time, and it's a tried and true method to... Move a behavior pattern, if you will. Make an example of a few. Government's been doing it for years. Hell, what, what the hell do you think the Bundys are all about? Government is making an example in order to get the rest of us to bend to its will, if you will. To get the rest of us to behave in a manner they deem appropriate. Well, you know what? We can use that same kind of mentality, that same kind of process on them without becoming the monster that we are fighting. Because all we have to do is say, okay, good for you. Works for us too. We like that game plan. So let's make an example of a few of these doctors and big pharma companies that are producing and dispensing this shit. And pharmacists. Let's not leave them out of the mix. You know, go after the sales reps. Go after all of them. Start making examples of these people that are pushing these things simply because they're getting a kickback somewhere. Because they are contributing. It is a conspiracy, <clears throat> and I think they need to be nailed. Kaya, um, Kaya Senior Advisor W. David Jones also weighed in, stating that the opioid epidemic kills an average of 91 Americans a day. Beyond the human cost in lives and devastated families, the epidemic disrupts our economy with reduced productivity and increased health care costs. We realize this administration has been reviewing its stance on legal marijuana and we appreciate U.S. Attorney Jeff Sessions' clarification to Congress regarding the Cole Amendment. The Cole Amendment is an Obama-era memo that directs U.S. attorneys to respect cannabis laws in states that legalize the plant and establish a regulatory framework. See, once again, you have to have that regulatory framework. 
Y'all don't even have a freaking clue what regulations are already on the books and that you want to make sure you got a good regulatory framework. Though Sessions has consistently expressed his opposition to cannabis, he acknowledged the validity of the memo in March. Yeah. The way it's supposed to work is home rule. Man is king of his castle or his home. So long as he does not infringe upon someone else's rights, so long as he does not abuse or whatever, break any contracts with someone else, leave him the hell alone. He's doing just fine in his own little castle. That, that is where the bulk of the power should rest. Then it extends out to the community. They get a little bit, just a little sliver of that pie. Then it extends out to the town or township. Then it extends out to the county. Then to the state. Then to the federal government. Federal government is supposed to have this little itty bitty infinitesimal little sliver that is just supposed to make sure that the borders are safe. That's pretty much what the federal government is supposed to do. Somehow or another, things got flippy floppied. That's, that's the way it was taught to me, at least. And I kind of sort of like that. You know, if you have, yeah, if, if their job is just to make sure that, that nobody is infringing upon our little pile of dirt, but, you know, they have a tendency to even morph that a little bit and say, well, you know, hmm, okay. I'm going to go ahead and share this again, just because, just because, because I have a couple other ones that I want to get to as well. Um. Who who already kicked out? Oh. Iceland closing all McDonald's? Ah, ah, darn it all. I feel really bad. And I'm sure all of the people in Iceland are going, Oh, no more special sauce from Ronnie McDonald. You know, that's kind of gross. I'm thinking if somebody has special sauce that has that kind of coloration and those kind of chunks, you probably ought to see someone for that. Just saying. Grimmy says they also kicked out the Rothschild bankers. Yay! Yay! Okay. I'm going to put this over in the effing site real quick. And then... I'm going to go to another one that I have that I actually saw earlier today, I believe over on Mines. And, um, okay, why are you thinking so hard? My computer is thinking really, really hard. Really, really hard. Oh, it must be because it's from the trenches. That must be why. Well, you just keep thinking. Just keep thinking. I'll put this over on mines while it's thinking. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. I also have someone over here on mines that deemed that they needed to downvote quite a few of my postings. It's like, ah, oh, I have a fan. <laughs> I know I have a weird way of looking at things, but I have a fan. At least they're a fan enough to, to say, oh, we don't like what you're posting. Okay. So, oh, okay. Just a real quick couple of these uh, things. I'm looking over here on the essential oils page over here on Facebook. Ten drops of Helchrisium and frankincense added to a 10 milliliter roller bottle with the roller bottle top and fill it, top it off with fractionated coconut oil 
and uh, that's great for your complexion and blemishes and redness and overall skin health. Use it on your face or, you know, elbows, stuff like that. Mm hmm. Um, and if you are having troubles with, you know, like achy muscles or anything like that, here's a really good soak for you, which I thought, wow, how cool is this? One cup of Epsom salt, two drops of frankincense, two drops of Siberian fur, and two drops of marjoram. Now, I do Epsom salt and usually uh, eucalyptus and sometimes a little bit of lemongrass, but I rarely put frankincense. Sometimes I'll put lavender in the bath, but just giving you little different little things to try with your oils. Okay, now, seeing as how I was talking about all this other fun stuff with Candy Buzz. So, from Russia. You know them damn dastardly Russians. Them dear guys that are always trying to, you know, control our government. Clown juice. Clown juice! Ew, that's just gross, Grim. Ew. Okay, from RT.com. Russia looks to become leading organic food exporter as Europe sees future in GMO. Which, ah, Europe doesn't see much of a future in GMOs, so therefore they're, and they're really trying to step away from the GMO. This is from September of this year. And it says, last week, an EU court ruled Italy cannot ban the cultivation of an EU-approved genetically modified crop, thus publicly supporting GMO. At the same time, Russia has been ramping up production and export of organic food. GMO has been banned in Russia since 2016. Recently, the organic food market has definitely expanded in Russia. The organically produced food industry held a market value of 178 million in 2015. That's an increase from 2010's 116 million total. That's from their economist, Iriana Kabuta of the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, Regional Office for the Europe and Central Asia. Euromonitor has also noticed increased spending on prepackaged organic food and drink in Russia. 2015 saw consumers purchase close to $12 million worth of packaged eco-foods. Russia exports organic buckwheat, millet, alfalfa, flax, and wildly grown products including wild berries, mushrooms, cedar nuts, and herbs to a variety of countries. Russia also exports organic wheat to the EU. Because there's a lot of people that don't want that wheat that's been treated with uh, Roundup to cause desiccation on it. In other words, to get it to dry up faster, to turn faster, to prepare for harvest faster. Because those glyphosates get in there and they're starting to see studies with results that show that that could be the primary cause of people having gluten intolerance issues is all the frickin' glyphosate. In 2015, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced plans to make the country the largest supplier of healthy, ecologically clean, and high-quality food which Western producers have long lost. While Russia already has a significant share of the European market at around $2 billion, or 11.8% of Russia's overall agricultural exports, there are obstacles in increasing this share. The main obstacles in increasing exports of agri-food goods to the EU market are non-conformity with EU food safety requirements. Here we go. We have rules. We have hoops. You must jump through them. 
Oh, and then the small tariff import quotas applied by the EU for agricultural goods, infrastructural and regulatory issues. Oh, we must regulate even if you're doing it by the book. We have to have document, document, documentation because I have an idiot cousin that can't do anything but take this little red rubber stamp and stamp it in the ink pad and then stamp it on your paperwork. Sign in triplicate. Oh, and this is with regard to the export of organic products. In Russia, there is no official certification system or certifying agency, the economist said, which basically means that they don't have those uh, crazy-ass regulations. Why? Well, you know, maybe they're considering, you know, word of mouth. And, you know, if somebody does something that proves that they are not, you know, in other words, they start off with a little trust, maybe. I don't know. Call me crazy. Maybe I'm reading way too much into it. Due to the lack of proper regulation in Russia, you know them damn Rushkis, and here they don't have regulation in an area. Local producers keen to operate in organic food have to obtain official certification from third parties like the United States or the EU because, well, even though they are growing their stuff elsewhere, you have to apply to us for official certification. Da 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 da. And this is in order for them to label their products as officially certified bio or organic, and be able to export them outside of Russia. Ah, so Russia doesn't have a problem with them exporting it, but everybody else has a problem with them exporting it out of Russia. Alrighty. Hmm. The draft law on the production of organic agricultural products and amendments to legislative acts of the Russian Federation, blah, 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 blah has not yet been adopted. However, the situation has improved after Russia adopted the National Standard for Organic Products. Now, this is probably just another reason why Russia did it. Because, well, yeah, Russia did it. They outmaneuvered, and now they're starting to cut into Uncle Sugar's pie. And Uncle Sugar don't like that, so Uncle Sugar's putting up all kind of roadblocks. And pointing fingers, forgetting that every time they point a finger, three more are pointing right back at themselves. You keep it up, Uncle Sugar. You're doing a damn good job of being a shining example of being an ass munch. Okay, and this Bitcoin stuff, you know, I don't understand all of this Bitcoin stuff. And quite frankly, I don't know that Bitcoin is necessarily worth that much. I just think the dollar is just totally sucking. I mean, you can tell that at the grocery store. Dollar don't buy doodly squat anymore. So is the Bitcoin really going up in value or is the dollar going down? Uh, or is it a combination of the two? Either way, I would much rather have something that I can hold in my hand, even if it's not worth a whole hell of a lot. I prefer to have that than to have something that's out there in the cybernetic wherever, where someone, all they have to do is just hack in and get it. Or, you know, the electricity power grid goes down and you're just, SOL, because Bitcoin is cyber currency. So, yeah, I would much rather have something in my hand, something tangible that I can actually trade with. Call me old-fashioned, call me crazy. Hell, I've been called worse. Okay. Apparently, From the Trenches World News Report does not wish to post. So, at least not over here on this effing site. 
I don't think people realize how the establishment became established. It simply stole the land and property off the poor, surrounded themselves with weak-minded sycophants for protection, gave themselves titles, and have been wielding power ever since. Ah, that's from Tony Ben. Thank you, Cowboy Tech. He just posted this over here on uh, the effing site. Um, you've never gone shopping for doodly squat oh grim honey you know it's wonderful um i don't give it away i don't because doodly squats are really hard to come by and so they <laughs> i just really don't give a doodly squat to anybody <coughs> trustees back hi p bunion i see you hun it is alive. Trust no one. Um, why is silver cheaper to buy than to mine? Because uh, they're playing with the markets. That's why. Somebody is jerking shit around. Oh, Lord. Grimmy or cowboy, that one's kind of scary. Of course, just the image in that meme is kind of scary. I'm just, I can't help myself, TD. Every time I look in the shout box, I got to wave at you. It's, and I know you can't see me, but I'm still waving at you. Okay. Let me share this link over here, seeing as how the other one didn't wish to share. There you go. Yum, 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 yum. Where's a little guy that's chowing down? I know he's in here somewhere. Somewhere. There he is. Okay. Now, back to my pocket I go. Now, seeing as how I've been talking about GMOs, let's go check out what's going on down in Brazil. Shall we? This is also from RT.com. Yeah, I kind of loitered there for a while today. Monsanto sued by Brazilian soybean farmers over GMO seed. This is from November of this year. Um... Growers in Brazil's largest soybean producing state have asked a court to cancel Monsanto's Intacta GMO seed patent. They claim irregularities, including the company's alleged failure to prove it brings de facto technology innovation. The uh, <clears throat> Mato Grosso branch of Apro okay, yeah, branch of that place. The association representing the growers has filed a lawsuit in a federal court in Brazil. The growers claim that Monsanto's Intacta RR2 Pro patent does not fully reveal the invention so as to allow at the end of the exclusivity, exclusivity period for any person to freely have access to it. That requirement avoids... Um, that the company controls a technology for an undetermined period of time, um, April Soha said, adding that Intacta's patent protection extends through October of 2022. It cited data from con um, from consultancy. AgroConsult, saying that about 53% of Brazil's soy area was planted with Intacta technology in the 2016-17 crop cycle. Around 40% of the crop is grown with Monsanto's Roundup Ready seed technology, and only 7% is non-genetically modified. The Brazilian farmers have been continually urging the replacement of genetically modified soybeans with non-GM seeds. Recently, they asked Monsanto and other producers for pest-resistant corn seeds to reimburse them for money spent on additional pesticides when the bugs killed the crops instead of dying. Several years ago, 5 million Brazilian soybean farmers sued Monsanto, claiming that the genetic engineering company 
was collecting royalties on crops it unfairly claims as it owns. Ah! In 2012, the Brazilian court ruled in favor of the Brazilian farmers, saying that Monsanto owes them at least two billion with a B since 2004. After the legal disputes, Monsanto stopped collecting royalties linked to its first-generation Roundup Ready technology, and some farmers agreed to get a discount rate to use intacta seeds. The Biotech Corp are genetically engineered to, or biotech crops, are genetically engineered to resist pests or disease, tolerate drought, or withstand the spraying of weed killers like glyphosate, the active ingredient in Monsanto's Roundup herbicide. In the U.S., the herbicide was was considered safe. It Okay, now they did not say it was proved safe. It was considered safe since 2013 when Monsanto received approval from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for increased tolerance levels for glyphosate. Yeah, the EPA said, oh, it's okay, you can adjust the numbers. However, recently... The World Health Organization, who, yeah, that's who, ruled it is a carcinogen which, along with other Monsanto chemicals, could cause Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, autism, and cancer. Oh, they're being sued. Oh, again. I hope they continue to be sued. Again and again and again. Hi, C -C Carl. How are you doing, hon? Let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, cool. Wow. Trusty is having fun, apparently. Sweet, I'm I'm glad you have fun. Okay, um, let me put this over here uh, in the FN site as well. Darn Monsanto, I feel so bad. Not. I think I will do the little guy with the dollar signs. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I'll put this over on on mines as well just because which by the way hi mines if anybody's here do you mind I don't I'm not very good at minding <laughs> or behaving but I'm very good most of the time until I'm not <laughs> oops and then trying to be a snarky smart ass and I still can't spell what the hey what the hey? Okay, and one last thing. Just because I feel so bad, I'm picking on them. Why does everyone hate Monsanto? Why, oh why? I don't understand. It's not like they're going out to poison people. This is from ModernFarmer.com, and it was originally posted... Uh, March the 4th of 2014, but, ah, you know, even that far back, you know, three and a half years ago, and they were wondering, why does everyone hate Monsanto? Apparently, the house was raised above the ground like a mushroom or a white ray gun. Dot, that. Its rooms radiating out like spokes of a wheel. It was 1957, and this was the house of the future, a prototype modular house created by Monsanto in collaboration with MIT to help solve the housing crisis baby boom America was having or was in the middle of. Not coincidentally, the house was made of plastic, one of Monsanto's products at the time. They imagined fast subdivisions of this house, 
like Levittown, says Gary Van Zandt, curator of the architecture and design at MIT Museum. And while it never happened, Walt Disney did select it as an ex exhibition at its new Disneyland. And for 10 years, until it was torn down, the chemical giant's creation stood peacefully in the happiest place on earth, where millions of people marveled at it. And then, it really was safe to say that if Monsanto's pod house were erected there today, it would not be such a happy place. Over the past decade, Monsanto has become a pop culture boogeyman, the face of corporate evil. The company and its genetically modified organisms the seeds have been the subject of muckraking documentaries such as Forks Over Knives and GMO OMG. Global protests and assaults by everybody from environmental activists to the Colbert Report, Facebook and other social media are awash in memes devoted to the topic and hashtags like Monsanto Evil, or I just like to call him Monsanto. And it seems everyone, from your plumber to your mother, has an opinion about the company. This past year, when Monsanto bought a weather data company called the Climate Corporation for about one b -b 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 billion dollars, David Friedberg, the company's past uh, CEO found himself bending over backwards, justifying his decision to sell. In other words, he legally changed his name to Ben Dover. Good job, David. Hmm. Yeah, as if the money wasn't enough of a reason. But Friedberg told the New Yorker that even his father disapproved. His first reaction was, Monsanto, the most evil company in the world? I thought you were trying to make the world a better place. <laughs> yeah. Friedberg also felt compelled to write a letter to his entire staff, laying out his rationale for Monsanto's aptness as the new owner. In short, you don't need to have a degree in marketing and communications to see that Monsanto has a serious PR problem. So how did this happen? How did Monsanto go from the future of American innovation to a late-night punchline? Well, critics point out their role in GMOs, creating Frankenfood. But Monsanto is not the only company that produces genetically modified organisms. And though it has a bad environmental record, so do lots of companies. Okay, so just because General Motors jumps off a cliff. Does that mean that Monsanto needs to as well? Just because Monsanto is doing something, does that mean everyone else needs to do it too? No. You see that example and you go, wow, there's shit. Let's not behave like that. Also, Unlike, say, ooh, other corporate villains like General Motors, the anti-hero of Michael Moore's Roger and Me, Monsanto is not a consumer-facing company, and its actual biotechnological workings are mystifying to the average person. Mm, not really. Yet, somehow it manages to serve as a focal point for popular fear and rage about everything from political pandering to globalization. Why, you may ask? Well, the answer, of course, is complicated. But numerous experts point to a fuse, a bungled launch of GMO seeds in Europe in the late 1990s, that progressed into a vicious war of disinformation that shows little sign of abating. And if you set aside for a moment from the usual debate about whether GMOs are bad or good, a curious fact emerges. For a rich and powerful company that seems to excel at nearly everything it does, 
Monsanto sucks in one important aspect, spin control. And you know, before I get too much further in this, there is a definite difference between hybridization and genetic modification. Hybridization is when you're doing a blending of two different plants that are of, you know, similar genus, if you will, because they're, you're trying to grow the next crop to be something that is more tolerant to weather conditions or, you know, growing conditions, which is basically the same thing, uh, different type of soil, disease, um, let's see, better protection against diseases or insects. And it is a hybridization because you have one plant in this family, let's say, that does really well at not having the bugs attack it quite so much. So you cross pollinate or you cross breed this one with that one. It is something that can happen in nature, but you're just kind of helping it along. Whereas genetic modifications are not things that can happen in nature. That is one of the big differences between hybridization and genetic modification. Just putting that out there. So, and they have a few memes here that are just quite fun. Um, you know, like, um, so the U.S. oppose chemical warfare, but approve the Monsanto Protection Act. And if Monsanto's GMOs are safe, why does their cafeteria serve only organic food? Good question. I've read about that several times, not just in memes, but actual articles with links to and all that fun stuff. And, you know, it was on the Internet, so it must be true. So, <clears throat> Further down, it says, let the record reflect that before Monsanto became the face of industrial agriculture, it courted controversy in other ways, namely as a chemical company. Founded in 1901, Monsanto was one of a handful of companies that produced Agent Orange. Yeah, that lovely stuff. And its main poison, dioxin. It sold DDT, PCBs, the controversial dairy cow hormone, RBGH, and the cancer-linked aspartame sweetener, which, yeah, that's some nasty shit. Which, by the way, they really haven't gotten rid of aspartame. They just renamed it. Starting in the... Um, 80s, however, Monsanto shed its chemicals and plastics division. Oh, yeah, it shed them. Uh-huh. No, they have been moved off into the... You've been very bad, bad boy. So they've been shuttled off into a dark corner. And they're, they're owned by a shadow company that's still part of the web of Monsanto companies. They also bought up seed companies, invested in biogenetics research, and ultimately reincorporated itself as an agricultural company. See, that's how they do it. If things are not, you know, it's kind of like Bayer, you know, during uh, World War II when they broke up some of the big German conglomerates and they became three to five different companies and all of a sudden all of those companies are all now molding back into one again. And who just bought Monsanto? Wasn't that Bayer? Yeah. Or is that still in the works? Oh, well, to go back to this. Its first GMO product, the patented glyphosate-resistant Roundup Ready soybean, was approved by the USDA in 1994. But most Americans hadn't heard of Monsanto until it tried to sell the seeds to Europe. And that's when things turned sour. In 1996, the UK was reeling from the mad cow disease epidemic in which the British government insisted the highly dangerous disease posed no risk to human health, while people were dying. Yeah, 
pay no attention to that person over there that's brain is now Swiss cheese and and yeah it has nothing to do with what you, that whole you are what you eat thing oh that's just a saying yeah the Brits had gotten a fast education in the modern farm system and were primed to be suspicious of GMOs supposed safety Although the seeds were approved by the European Union. <laughs> in other words, oh, look at this sliding at me from underneath the table. Wow, I feel wealthy. I won't spend it all in one place. The consumers rebelled in England. Grocery store chains pushed back. Tabloids printed stories about frankenfoods. And the environmental groups such as Greenpeace swung into action with high-profile campaigns. Even Prince Charles, a longtime supporter of organic farming, wrote a newspaper editorial opining that genetic engineering takes mankind into realms that belong to God and to God alone. As if Prince Charles, oh well, Prince Charles probably thinks he is God and therefore that is mine too. Just don't go out in the breeze, Charlie. Because them ears will just beat the shit out of you. This reaction caught Monsatan execs off guard. Oh, they are aghast. How could such a thing happen? As Dan Charles writes in his book, Lords of the Harvest, Philip Engel, the head of Monsatan's corporate communications at the time, bemoaned that the Brits were sad sacks of Europe for their suspicion of GMOs. But Monsatan believed it could overcome the problem with a little cash under the table, I'm sure. The predominant attitude at the company was, if they don't like it, if they try to block it, we can sue them. There you go. If it's such a good idea and they don't want to participate, we'll force them to. That's how you do that. That was from a former Monsatan employee who asked to remain anonymous. Huh, imagine that. Monsatan responded with what it's supposed to be a cleverly counterintuitive $1.6 million ad campaign that read, Food biotechnology is a matter of opinions. Monsatan believes you should hear all of them. The ads included the phone numbers of opposing groups, such as Greenpeace, but the advertisements struck their audience as glib and insincere. You know, sometimes you just plain can't hide the stench of glibness and insincerity. It's kind of like the pungent aroma of sarcasm. You know, there are times when I just look at people and go, man, you couldn't tell that was sarcasm because that stuff reeks of it. Wee! Too little too late, Monsatan tried a different track. Engaging in a dialogue with, with stakeholders all over Europe. Monsatan's then CEO, Robert Shapiro, even apologized for the company's condescension and arrogance at a Greenpeace meeting via video uplink in 1999. Oh, we're so sorry that we actually outwardly seemed condescending and arrogant. We were really trying to keep that on a back burner so you wouldn't see it. Damn, I hate that body language shows through. Apparently the damage had already been done, and Monsatan emerged from the bungled launch of GMOs in the UK looking like a bully. And the image stuck. Yes, it did. And then Monsatan decided to start suing farmers. Oh wait, that's a whole other story. Or maybe not. Hmm... So, what started as a problem in England became fodder for a global conversation in which environmental groups had the upper hand. In 1998, Monsatan announced plans to acquire a seed company called Delta Pine and Land Company. Delta Pine had developed and patented seed that could only propagate once. The Terminator. Ah! as it was ingeniously dubbed by environmentalists. It could not be saved and replanted by farmers, ostensibly forcing the farmers to have to buy fresh seed every year. 
Wow! Talk about Assholio Deluxe! I wonder just exactly what that would do to the food chain. Hmm. Summoning up negative emotional responses to the Terminator was a powerful PR tactic from environmentalists in British GMO debate, and it only continued to be as the controversy caught on in the U.S. In fact, the seed pro um, proved such a hot potato that Monsatan never commercially introduced it. And yet... The Terminator continues to live on in anti-GMO rhetoric. In a 2009 documentary, David vs. Monsatan, about a Canadian farmer who was sued by the seed giant, the Terminator seed is presented as if it is a viable Monsatan product. Now this does go on for quite some time, but I'm really quite tired of Monsatan. My mouth is starting to feel really, you know, that ucky taste you get in your mouth, you know, like the morning after hangover kind of tastes like a cat took a shit in a litter box in your mouth. Yeah, that's what all this con conversing about Monsatan has made my mouth taste like. Ack. Fui. What? What about Princess Diana? Oh, I know they took her out, too. Okay, two-stroke diesels are rare. Da, da, da. I'm going to catch up on the chat here. <laughs> so, what all's going on over here from the trenches? Insane California government criminalizes teaching trade skills. Youth education must... Oh, well. <laughs> Isn't that just special? So, yeah, we don't want you learning how to do anything by yourself. And yes, Prince Charles is a major wackadoo. Do, wackadoo, 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 wackadoo. Hmm. Split. Are you are you spitting, Carl? <laughs> Aye. Poor Princess Diana. I actually liked her, at least from what I saw of her. But I never really met her in per well. Duh, that's pretty obvious. I never met the Princess of England. <laughs> okay. I think I will do that one and get that shared. Do, I can do, I can do, I can do, I can do. God, dandruff, some of it itches. Put this one over on mines as well. Golly gee. Oops. Okay. Back to my pocket I go. Or maybe, hey, you know what? I haven't been to the pig of late or of early. Let's go see what them crazy guys over on PIGazette.com have to say for themselves today. Because I'm sure them boys are up to no good. They always are up to no good because they're just darn me like that. In their word of the day, once again, boys, word of the day, that is not pluralized, so this does not work. Extreme sport is two words, sweetheart. Phrase of the day. It's a 21st century replacement for Rome's infamous gladiator games. Like their Roman counterparts, spectators at these alleged sporting events wait with bated breath to see the synaptically challenged participants achieve room temperature doing something stupendously stupid. Yup. Also called reality TV. Lots of people watch that shit too. It's like, really? What the hell? In the quotable quote section, the sexual revolution begun in the 1960s has reached the reign of terror stage. That's according to Richard Fernandez. Thank you, Richard Fernandez, for, yeah, 
playing the role as Captain Obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a scary world out there these days. Okay. And this date in history, the 6th of December, 1932. Holy rampaging follicles, Batman. Infamous boxing promoter Don, I invented the bad hair day, Sparky King, begins his reign of hair despair terror in Cleveland, Ohio. Happy barf day, Don King. This date in history, the 6th of December, 1973, the unrivaled king of the executive branch Prattfall, Gerald Ford, is sworn as, in as America's first unelected vice president, replaces king of the executive branch one-liners Spiro T. Agnew. Woohoo! And finally, this date in history, the 6th of December, 1980, Jim Baker gets his holy roller ashes hauled by Jessica Hahn. I have sinned against you and my God. I have had sexual relations with that woman. I have no idea if that's what he said, but... There's so damn many preachers that did that whole blubbery, blubbery, I've sinned against you and my God. Mm, you don't need to be telling me about this shit, and I'm sure you don't need to be telling God either. I'm sure he saw every bit of it and went, ew, ew. I don't think I designed it to look like, ew. Wow. Okay, moving along. Back over to... Uh, da -da. okay. Um, let's see. How about I go with this one? This one is from Breitbart News, and apparently, I must have really liked the headline or something because it's from Breitbart, and I rarely go to Breitbart anymore. So, it just really went downhill when Andrew got offed, you know. I really liked Andrew, and I'm going to have to read his book again. I have his book, and, and I learned quite a bit from reading that book, but they took his ass out. In any case, from Breitbart.com, from the 4th of December of this year, Dershowitz, you cannot charge a president with obstruction of justice for exercising his constitutional power. Ding, 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 da, 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 da. You know, it's like all these people that want to arrest Trump will still skin. Seriously, think this through. Please. Number one, there's a little something written into the Constitution where I do believe that he is protected while in the pursuance of, or in the, um, it's not pursuance. God. Dang it, I don't remember the actual verbiage that they used, but something about while he is on the job, you cannot arrest him. Once he's no longer on the job, yeah, you can, just like with any other congressional person. But, on Monday, Fox News channels, yeah, I know, faux news, Oh, and friends, the Harvard Law professor, Alan Dershowitz, bat batted down the merit of obstruction of justice charges aimed at President Donald Trump Stilskin for what he said was exercising his constitutional power and authority regarding the firing of the then FBI director, James Comey, and instructing the Department of Justice what to and not to investigate. Well, he is the head of the executive. And that is kind of, sort of, part of what the executive is supposed to be doing. Kind of, sort of. Just saying. If Congress were to ever charge him with obstruction of justice for exercising his constitutional authority under Article 2, we'd have a constitutional crisis. Hmm. Gee, maybe that's why they're doing it. You cannot charge a president with obstruction of justice for exercising his yada 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 blah 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 a constitutional power to fire Comey and his constitutional authority to tell the Justice Department who to investigate and who not to investigate. 
That's what Thomas Jefferson did. That's what Lincoln did. That's what Roosevelt did. We have precedents that clearly establish what presidents can do. And once again, just because you have precedents, just because little Tommy jumped off a bridge doesn't mean little Trumple Silskin can too. Although, you know, if he's going along with what it says in the Constitution, all, all these people that are saying, you can't do that, we're gonna. Have you ever read the thing that you're supposedly enforcing? I didn't think so. When George Bush, the first, pardoned Casper Weinberger in order to end the investigation that would have led to him. <laughs> Oops. Dershowitz continued, nobody suggested obstruction of justice. For obstruction by the president, you need clearly illegal acts. With Nixon, with Nixon, hush money paid, telling people to lie, destroying evidence, even with Clinton. They said that he tried to influence potential witnesses not to tell the truth. But there's never been a case in history where a president has been charged with obstruction of justice for merely exercising his constitutional authority. That would cause a constitutional crisis in the United States. Redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. In other words, you've got three paragraphs that would have worked in one. That's kind of sort of the problem with a lot of shit going on in D.C. Y'all need to stop that crap. You made me read it. Well, you didn't make me, but I did. I read thread three paragraphs that all three basically said same damn thing. You can't do it. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. He was just doing his job. Yeah. Okay, there. I went there. Now, I see a link off to the side. I'm going to have to go there. Because it's another nanny, nanny, boo, boo, stick your head and dog do kind of thing. So, what? Where'd it go? There it is. <laughs> Somebody needs to call a ambulance. Seriously. Because apparently young people say calling them a snowflake damages their mental health. Sweetheart, the reason why you're being referred to as a snowflake is because you have damaged mental health. It's really kind of hard to damage it worse than it's already been damaged. People are trying to point this out because knowing is half the battle. So, a new survey reveals that young people believe being called a snowflake could damage their mental health. They would feel really bad. A new survey by insurance firm Aviva found that 72% of the 16 to 24 year olds believe the term snowflake is unfairly applied to millennials. 74% of respondents took it a step further, arguing that they believe that the use of the label could have a negative effect on young people's mental health. Mwah. The study was born out of interest in the term snowflake generation, <laughs> if the flake fits, which was originally used to describe young people who thought they were unique or special. Such, or some suggest, it was popularized by a line in the 1996 novel Fight Club and its 1999 film adaptation, You Are Not Special. Spatial. You are not a beautiful and unique snowflake. Well, you may be spatial, but you're not spatial in a beautiful and unique snowflake kind of way. The word's meaning eventually evolved to mean overly sensitive. Mm -hmm. It is often used to describe college students who claim that they are off-ended by controversial or even mundane ideas. Oh, that gives me an emotional boo-boo. You need to stop it. And calling me a snowflake just makes me melt worse. Now I'm a, snush, I'm a slush puddle. 
There you go. Start calling them slush puddles. See how they like that shit. I'll bet they'll start saying, no, please, seriously, start calling me a snowflake again. That doesn't sound nearly as derogatory. Mm. Chuck Palahniuk, who is the author of Fight Club, has embraced the rise in popularity of the term. There's a new kind of new Victorianism, he said. Every generation gets off-ended by different things, but my friends who teach in high school tell me that their students are very easily off-ended. In other words, thin-skinned. Dr. Doug Wright argues that because young people are more likely to experience mental health issues than older generations, really? <laughs> because you said so? They are especially susceptible to damage as a result of usage of snowflake label. You know, uh, I'm going to throw a lot of this on the parents because the parents didn't say, pull up your big girl panties or your big boy tiny whities. Yeah, buckle up, buttercup. Life gets bumpy. Apparently, their findings suggest that young adults are more likely to be experiencing mental health problems, so using a phrase which criticizes this age group could add to this issue. Well, uh, you know, we were called hippies and druggies and all kind of shit when I was in that age group, and, and I just went, so? Because <laughs> it really was kind of sort of descriptive. <laughs> Oops. Any term used disparagingly to a segment of the population is inherently negative. Negative, negative. You know what, honey? Deal with it. Overcome it. While young adults in particular appear to take offense to the snowflake label, the majority of adults agree that the term is unfair and unhelpful. Yeah, because snowflakes are actually pretty. And I think it's rather defaming to the snowflake, actually. So it's important that people consider how such labels are used and the cumulative effect that it could have on their recipients. Well, I will stop. I will try to stop calling you snowflake because, quite frankly, I do think snowflakes are a lot prettier. And I don't, I kind of sort of, you know, especially when they're the really big snowflakes, I'm still enough of a child. I will go outside and try and catch them on my tongue, but I don't want my tongue coming anywhere near none of y'all whiny asses. Y'all are a bunch of petulant three-year-olds in 17-year-old bodies. Grow the fuck up, buttercup. How about I call you buttercup? How's that sound? Big babies. You know, Vinny, there's an awful lot of them that are off-ended. <laughs> and nowhere, nowhere in the Constitution, you know, this vaunted piece of paper that, um, after all, these children probably don't know what's in it in the first place other than they have been told, you have rights. Yes, you do. Everyone does. And your rights do not trump anyone else's rights. So, stop and consider this for just a minute. Okay, buttercup? If something offends you and you expect that person to stop doing that, then if you do something that offends someone else, you in turn are expected to stop doing whatever that is. If you are not willing to stop doing whatever is offensive to others, then shut the fuck up. Buttercup. Ooh. 4.2 earthquake just shook Southern California. Well, getting a little hot down there. All them fires are making Mother Nature go, ouch, that burns. Hmm. What is that, Goober? Goober? What is that? I see you shared a link. 
Now I'm being nosy. <laughs> what is this? Imgur. I put some... Ha <laughs> ha! Oh. Go on, Goober. Okay. I'm going to put this little snowflake thingy over here. I'm sorry. See, I already went back on my word. Oops. Oh, shit. <laughs> How about I just call you little swirlers? How's that sound? Want to be known as a little swirler? Better than being called a floater. Just saying. Although they both mean the same thing. <laughs> At least in my books. Okay. I'm going to do th I'm this special little unicorn. <laughs> You're just a special little something, aren't you? Cutie pie. Uh, with rainbows and butterflies. Ooh. Okay, we'll just stick with the uni. Mm. Dang, I'm almost out of time. How the heck that happen? Okay. Do you ever get really motivated to do something and you get really excited about it and when you get home you're just like, nah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's me. I have a tendency to do that from time to time. Okay, I'm going to go back to my pocket. Just because. Just because. Hmm. <gasps> I know. Here we go. Here we go. I think the lovely Kate shared this the other day in the RLM chat. And I really need to learn to start using some of these. These are the Tim Hawkins Handbook Alternative Cuss Words. They're field tested and mother approved. So, if I am miffed, I should say shucks or rat or gosh or shizzle or toot. You know, last time I heard shizzle, it was from James Kingsley. That was the last time I heard shizzle. And it was like, whoa. Seriously, a grown man just said that. Wow. I like James, but wow. Also, crapola is a good one. I like that word, crapola. Or turd, or sheesh, or flippin'. I say flippin' a lot. Because there's lots of times I want to say another F word that's one of my favoritest in the whole wide world. How about fooey, or ticked, or heck, or shoot, or jeepers, or jeez, or crud, dag, Dang, darn, darn it. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, wow, snot. I have never said snot in anger. I just haven't. I've been bleeped a time or two. And booger. I have said booger. When I talk dirty to someone, I say booger, shit. <laughs> How about wingnut or nerds? No, criminy. Mm, I say criminy a lot. And cripes. I, I rarely say caca. Son of a biscuit? No. Nope. Son of a biscuit eater? Ooh. <laughs> preach. Son of a Baptist preacher? I've never said that one. Wow. Son of a bacon bit. Hi, you little son of a bacon bit. Get your ass over here. Uh, patootie? I say patootie all the time. <laughs> There's some fun ones here, Miss Kate. I'm going to have to... Mmm. Oh, my lanta. <laughs> I've heard people say that, too. And it's like, what you just said? What? What did you just say? What the hell? Okay. How about I just go fark? Oh, just fark off. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm short-timing it here. So, let's go play. Shall we? Hmm. Wow, sure, she made ricin in her senior apartment and tested it out on her fellow residents. But the other crime is the courtroom stench. Ooh, I don't know that I want to know about that one. You guys over in FARC get some really weird headlines. 
a woman who thought she was terminal attempts suicide and fails. She finds out while recovering in the hospital that she wasn't terminally ill. Sometimes fate can be kind. Really? Hmm? How about the son of a whore? Oh, hey. You son of a Jezebel, ye. Hey, it sounds more fun when you say it with a twang, though, Vin, uh, Grimmy. You son of a Jezebel. Hmm. I like that. I like that, Grim. I have to work on that. Do you ever re get really motivated to do something? <laughs> you mean you don't, Grammy? Wow. Hmm. No, the officer doesn't have the right to transfer naked videos of your girlfriend to his phone, even if he's being arrested for embezzlement. Oh, well, let's just check this out, shall we? Because this is under the creepy category over here on FARC. What the hell? WTVR.com An ex-officer, wow, who the funk? Ex-officer charged for downloading sexual videos during arrest. Okay, sweetheart, why in the hell did you do that in the first place? Lord. In Colonial Heights, Virginia, a former Colonial Heights police officer, excuse me, was arrested for allegedly taking explicit videos from a cell phone of a suspect being arrested and putting them on his personal phone. Huh? Huh? Brian Glenn Drake, age 30, was charged with three counts of misdemeanor embezzlement and three counts of obstruction of justice after evidence and testimony was presented at a grand jury November the 6th. The alleged crime occurred, alleged, Although the video was on his phone, I don't know how it got there. I have this Samsung phone, and it's got this swipe thing, and it must have gotten too close, and, and there it was. Yeah. The alleged crime occurred in March when the officer arrested a suspect and his girlfriend over drug charges. Druggies. During the arrest, Drake transferred to himself short videos of the arrested suspect's girlfriend, according to the lawyer the lawyer of the owner of the phone. The lawyer said that the officer went through the phone and found the videos, which were short, but of an explicit nature. Hmm. They were made by the girlfriend of the individual Drake arrested. And everyone was an adult. Okay. The downloads were discovered later, and on June the 7th, the Colonial Heights Police Department began an investigation into allegations of Drake's misconduct. Naughty, naughty, naughty! Within 12 hours after the allegation was made, the officer was suspended and never returned to work as a police officer when the, within the department. This is according to Colonial Heights Chief of Popo, Colonel Jeffrey Ferries. <laughs> There's some kind of poetic justice in the world when the chief of Popo is Jeffrey Ferries. Hi, Ferries. Hi, Colonel Ferries. <laughs> Apparently, Drake tendered his resignation during the initial phase of the investigation. Because it looks better on the resume when you resign as opposed to being terminated. And, excuse me, since there is no nationwide kind of network to where you can kind of keep track of these ass munches, I'm sure he went somewhere else and went, I resigned. And now I would like a job. I have so many years of experience. That's pretty much the way that shit works. Difficult as it is for any Popo department to have charges brought against one of their own, we aggressively pursue any allegations of misconduct because nothing is more important than the integrity of the department and the confidence that the community has in this organization, Fairies said. <laughs> 
We support the decision made by the grand jury and will continue to support the prosecution. Well, if you're going to continue to prosecute, that would be pretty freaking awesome. Colonel Fairies. <laughs> I love it. I'm sure he doesn't pronounce it like that. And if he does, bless your heart. You're just too funny. Okay. What quote are you adding, Rob Works? It is more profitable for your Congress to support the tobacco industry than your life. Ah, yeah, go figure. More profitable for who? Oh, wait, on multiple levels it is. Wow, that's a good one. Go on, Rob Works. Okay, back to Farkles I go. Because I saw something from Florida. And I just got to go there. Don't point your lasers at police helicopters unless you want the helicopter to land and have a pilot track you down and arrest you. Really? Let's go see how fun this is. It's probably not that much fun, but hey. Pasco Sheriff's pilot lands helicopter and confronts laser pointer suspect. <gasps> you been pointing at me? Yes, I am very juvenile, Grim. I, I, yeah, I'll wear that badge proudly. <laughs> oh. According to authorities, pilot Stephen Bowman was assisting deputies who responded to a barricaded suspect call in Port Ritchie. Bowman was providing uh, cover for ground units going into the barricaded suspect's home when the helicopter was targeted by a laser pointer. Ah! It blinded us temporarily for a couple seconds. That's what temporarily means, hon. <clears throat> and it was extremely painful. Okay. Once we came to, we saw a couple more flashes from the laser. Once you came to, how powerful was that laser pointer? Apparently, the pointer was causing enough of a distraction that Bowman was compelled to pull away from the assignment. But Bowman didn't fly away. He tracked the laser pointer suspect. Bowman noticed a parking lot about a quarter mile from the suspect location that was large enough to safely land. And he landed the copter and walked over to the suspect's residence in the 7,000 block of Iron Bark Drive, where he detained the person. Deputies responded and took Ryan Fluke, 27, into custody. You fluke! It was a fluke, Ossifer. Um, Bowman said that Fluke was surprised to get the knock on his door. I immediately took him into custody, and then that's when he was a little confused on who was. I explained that I was a deputy pilot for the sheriff's office, and he wanted to know where my hel helicopter was. Ding, 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 honey, you just gave yourself away. Wow. He was charged with misuse of a laser pointing device, a third degree felony. Really? Hmm. All righty. Bowman said that Fluke apologized and said he didn't realize the laser was dangerous. From an open window Wednesday at his home, Fluke said he didn't want to talk without an attorney. But he was hanging out the window. Hmm. It's extremely satisfying to capture someone that was pointing a really bright light at us. Okay, it was a laser pointer. Really? Uh, Gooperzilla, you got to spell great the other way. It's still the same letters. It's just take that E and move it to the end. There will be great again or great ing. Mm. Yippee. Okay. Let me take one more look. Over here. Researchers test bone fragments suspected to be Santa's. What? Okay, this is from the BBC. Y'all over there are crazy. You know that, don't you? Of course, I have room to talk because. I'm uh, reading it. So, from the BBC.com, 
Santa's bone proved to be correct age. Wow. Dun, dun, dun. Apparently, a fragment of bone claimed to be from St. Nicholas, the 4th century saint, saintly inspiration for Father Christmas, has been radiocarbon tested by the University of Oxford. The test has found that the relic does date from the time of St. Nicholas, who is believed to have died around 343 A.D. Well, who in the hell is driving that sleigh? <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> While not providing... <laughs> While not providing proof that this is from the saint, it has been confirmed as authentically from that era. The Oxford team says that these are the first tests carried out on the bone. Thim bones, thim bones, thim Saint Nick bones. Relics of Saint Nicholas, who died in modern day Turkey, have been kept in the crypt of the Church of Bari. Bari in Italy since the 11th century. Really? I don't trust nothing about them some bitches over there. I think they lie about that shit. Apparently the popularity of the saint and the associations with Christmas have uh, seen many fragments of bone being taken to other locations. Raising questions about how many of these are authentic. You know, there's only so many bones in the human body. How many locations are we talking about here? Apparently, the tests in Oxford have been carried out on a fragment of pelvis, which had been in the church in France and is currently owned by a priest, Father Dennis O'Neill, Illinois, in the United States. Dang, see, Santa Claus really does get around. He's all over the place, literally. Hmm. The radiocarbon dating tests for the Oxford Relics Cluster at Keble College's Advanced Studies Center have confirmed that the bone is from the correct era. But that's about all they can confirm. Because they don't know if it's really from St. Nick or not. Hmm. Well, I bet. <laughs> It was a Santa bone. <laughs> I don't. I want. <laughs> I understand, Carl. I really don't want to know. <laughs> I really don't want to know nothing about this. Yeah. Hmm. Saint Nicola. That's almost like Ricola. I uh, know, I'm dating myself with my commercials. <gasps> okay, Grim, I don't know. How do you say this name? Uh, Cthul Cthulhu's? Cthulhu's army strikes again. China to develop a jellyfish shredder after getting tentacles stuck in its aircraft carrier's butt. <laughs> okay, this is... This is the, the last one for the night because I ain't got much time left. Apparently, China has developed a jellyfish shredder to keep its aircraft carriers safe from harm. Them dang tentacles. It launched its first homegrown aircraft carrier earlier this year in a ceremony filled with patriotic pomp as state media celebrated the country's growing naval power and technological mastery. However, before it can take take on the U.S. for sea supremacy, China must first deal with another formidable adversary. Swarms of jellyfish are teeming in the waters off the coast of China, particularly in the Yellow Sea, where they are proving to be a nuisance for Chinese warships. The marine invertebrates are being sucked into the ship's systems, clogging up the cooling pipes and causing the ships to overheat. Enough jellyfish sludge can even bring an aircraft carrier to a halt. Oh, this gives me all kinds. All kinds. Um, yeah, I know. He wasn't necessarily the sharpest tool in the shed there, Gubrazilla. Definitely not. Definitely. Definitely not. <laughs> 
Apparently, to address this sticky issue, Chinese researchers are currently working on what the South China Morning Post colorfully calls the jellyfish shredder. Why? You guys don't eat those things? You eat just about everything else. A massive net of sharp blades that is towed along by the boat, bringing jellyfish to the surface before slicing them up into tiny pieces, which no longer pose a threat to the Chinese warships. <sighs> That's just wrong. Why did the... Okay, I know what the jellyfish did to you, but I'm not thinking that that's necessarily a bad thing. Just saying. So as you can imagine, this method is not exactly ideal. For one thing, the jellyfish shredder doesn't only shred jellyfish, but also any other marine life unlucky enough to be near the surface as the ship goes by. So you're just shredding up marine life willy-nilly. You don't care. It's in the way. However, it is apparently the best thing that they've come up with so far to combat the mighty jellyfish. Oh, just you wait till Godzilla shows up. Japan is not too far away. They will send Godzilla. He will clean up that jellyfish mess and then follow you. Because, mmm. Is that why? Ew, god dang, that's a lot of jellyfish. However, however, it is apparently the best thing that they've come up with so far to combat the mighty jellyfish, and another method that was tried out involved pumping air into the ocean to create large bubbles so the jellyfish could be lifted to the surface and killed with pesticides. Mmm, I'm thinking chemical shit. Nope. Nope. Hmm. I don't know what to tell you guys. But y'all eat some weird stuff over there. Why don't you figure out a way to get a whole bunch of chefs over there going, Hey, hey, there's jellyfish in them there waters. You know, you could make all kind of money off of that. Maybe you could actually even pay for their aircraft carrier you got there. Maybe. Oh, well. Y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on this wacka 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 doodle Wednesday. And wow, that's a wacky ass way to end the show, isn't it? I will be back on Friday for the Freaker Friday edition of the Rocket Chair. But until then, y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening. I hope your Thursday is absolutely splendiferous. I won't be around. I will be going with my mom to visit my